Hi, we're here to talk about the first part of chapter two. It's a longer chapter, so we'll, we will be breaking it into a few different pieces. So this chapter really covers, uh, in brief, I should say, the history of management. So we will be looking at some of the more influential thinkers in this field. We are gonna look at several management principles that came out of that and the context for when they were initiated and published, as well as looking at what is happening now uh, and the trends that are occurring today. So, so quite a different context or environment, if you will. And at the end of this chapter, we will be talking about global impact as well as ethics. So that is what we are looking at upcoming. As we know, we are focusing this on the POLC framework. And the focus of the POLC framework is so that we can put all of the bits and pieces that we are learning about leadership management, organizational behavior into a framework for maybe a little bit you know, easier comprehension. And so the POLC framework, even though it was initiated you know, quite a while ago now, um, we are adapting it because the management situation in organizations today definitely doesn't look the way it looked, you know, 1910. So even though it's still relevant and a lot of those pieces are still here, right? We still plan, we still organize. Leadership looks quite different in 2021 than it did in 1925. So we work with it, we stay agile and we change it as needed. One of the very first uh, thinkers and writers on management was a gentleman called Henri Fayol. And I did take French, I did take French in school a uh, hundred years ago. So maybe around the time he was alive. Uh, but if any of you speak French, let me know if, if that's a, a severe mispronunciation of his name. But anyways, Henri Fayol was a French mining engineer, and he was brought into a mining company that was about to fail and was asked whether or not he could do a turnaround with this mining company to see if he could make them successful again. He did. He spent some years there and learning and uh, applying the principles that he came up with ended up being so successful that at the end of this all, he wrote a book around it. So this series of management principles are still around today, many of them, and we're gonna look at them in a moment. Um, so just to point out here that quite a bit of the management thinking that still is prevalent in organizations today came from the engineering field. Right, so not from psychology, not from sociology, but from engineering, um, uh, which makes us look at organizations today and companies today and say, it might have made sense 100 years ago, but we need to change and adapt them for the situation we are in today. But like we said, some of them still relevant. So there's 14 of them. I have them on three slides, so I'll go through them relatively fast. You should go back to the textbook and read about them more fully. So the first one is specialization uh, of labor, right? I have a few words in English that are hard for me to pronounce. This is one of them. We can also call this division of labor. And this is pretty simple. You can have specialists in an organization. You can have generalists. If you're a specialist, you're more productive because you're doing one thing instead of 35 things. Um, boring, yeah, but productive. So division of labor is number one, and we still see that in some organizations, especially bureaucracies, right, government, uh, large organizations where we have those silos or functional um, structures. Then the second one is authority and responsibility. So if you are a manager in an organization, it means you have the authority and you have the decision making power um, granted to you by the organization. And this means that as a manager in an organization, you have the authority to tell employees, individual contributors, what they should be doing, right? So we do task assignments, we clarify expectations, uh, and the manager also has the responsibility to make sure that the work gets done. Number three is discipline, right? We don't 
use these words anymore really in organizations, right? We don't say that workers must obey orders, but discipline is essentially that you or someone as an individual contributor, the employee, they do the tasks that they have been decide, um, assigned. And that means that the organization is gonna run better if everybody's doing their job, right? So that's what discipline is about. Four is unity of command, which means that hopefully you have one boss above you that is giving you these directions and tasks in matrix store organizations, we typically see more than one manager and that is cause for conflict. And we talk about that in the organizational structure um, chapter a little bit more. Ideally, those managers are on the same page, so it's not too confusing, but still um, <clears throat> one person telling us what to do is ideal if possible. Today, we don't really see that as clearly as maybe when Henri Fayol was around uh, producing things. Unity of direction, each group, each unit, right? Each department, each team, each person in the organization should follow one coordinated or one aligned strategy. So we set strategy at the top of, of the organization. It cascades down through the organization and there should be alignment so that everyone is working towards that same strategy. Six, subordination of individual interest. We come together in organizations to complete a goal or a vision that is greater than any one of us, <clears throat> excuse me, that any one of us could do on our own. That's why we have organizations, right? To accomplish big things. When we come into an organization, we are there for the benefit of the organization. And we typically receive some payments, some benefits, some other rewards for being there. So we have reciprocity. And because of this, the, the interest of the organization should always, always be put ahead of individual interest. We don't always see it that way, but that is the ideal, right? Number seven remuneration, there needs to be fair compensation. We are talking about organizational justice and fairness, again, in another chapter. We cover that in the motivation chapter. This is a key principle, uh, extremely relevant today. We pay attention to what is fair and what is not. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you know, jump to the motivation chapter. But here it was recognized even in the early writings on management that fair compensation is key or we get a lot of negative behaviors if we don't do that. Number eight is centralization and centralization really deals with where in the organization do we make the decisions. So clearly early 1900s it was centralized, it was a centralized organization where or where the decisions were made at the top. Today, we are seeing, as we talked about in chapter one, so go back if you wanna refresh your mind on that. But today we are decentralizing <clears throat> organizations more. And I apologize, it's winter here. So maybe a little bit of a cold going on here. So today we decentralize organizations to a greater extent um, which means we push down decision-making power to those who are closer to the product or closer to the service that is being delivered in that organization. We also know that this decision-making power being moved, it depends on, as I'm picking colors for my pen, like that is super important, right? It depends on the competency of the workers. So anybody who is in the decision-making role should have the knowledge and the competency to make decisions, which means we have to train and develop. We have to make sure that our employees are apt to make these decisions. So that's for management and leadership to make sure we have continuous training and development. Number nine, line of authority. So line of authority, according to hierarchies in the organization, typically, right, goes from the top of the organization down to the staff level, the production level, 
uh, and that's typically how we communicate. So you would communicate upwards to your boss, you would communicate downwards to your subordinates, your employees. Um, clearly we have lateral communication today. I would advise people as I do when I coach is that if you go around someone in the organization that would expect to have the communication come through them is that they should be aware, there should be a communication ongoing, uh, preferably proactively, right? So you will let somebody know that you're going around them or there can be a lot of frustration and confusion which can lead to conflict. Number 10, this applies to all of us right now, orderliness, right? Do we know where we can find our tools? Do we know where we can find our binders? Are we organized, right? So orderliness is necessary for an efficient workplace. And I don't even know how much time I spend on being orderly in my house. Uh, it, that's like a part-time job, right? 11 is equity. So making sure we have a fair, respectful, you know, just workplace. We need to be kind. We need to be fair to everyone. Extremely important to treat people with dignity and respect. Stability of tenure is principle number 12. I think it is pretty self-explanatory that we reap benefits if people stay longer in the organization. So tenure means we are there longer because we learn the organization, we get to know each other, we get to know how we do things, the processes, the norms, um, how we communicate, right? So learning curve is steep. When we come into an organization, you learn how to do things, it goes smoother. Somebody leaves the organization, you have to bring in somebody new and start all over. Um, so clearly we do a lot more of that now than we did a few decades ago. Number 13 is initiative. So if we are able to start something, to be creative, to be innovative, that's good for us because we enjoy that. We enjoy being in control. So having the opportunity to take initiative, it allows us to be happier and more satisfied in the workplace. So that's initiative. Number 14 is gonna test my French <laughs> um, skills again, which is esprit de corps, which means that we have harmony in the group, right? So you can call that group cohesion, right? Which we get from being from wanting cohesion is when we want when we like each other and want to stay in that group right um so we have harmony within the team that's a positive thing we spend a lot of time actually at work right and um so that promotes morale productivity satisfaction reduces conflict etc gallup one of our organizations here in the united states that measure everything workplace related um, on their Q12 uh, engagement measure that they um, do yearly, one of those 12 questions asks whether or not you have a friend at work, because that is how important that is. Okay, those are the 14 principles from Henri Fayot. Next, we have uh, Scientific Management by Frederick Taylor. And uh, we are continuing on the same path. We're looking at efficiency, we're looking at production. Uh, again, Taylor comes from an engineering background, so very sort of um, non-humane perspective, apart from that fair remunera remuneration, which still is in place in this thinking here. Uh, so scientific management really deals with the efficiency of organizations and how can we make them more efficient. So what he did was that he used a lot of what's called time studies, looking at how people executed on their tasks and what time each of the moments in those uh, executions took. And he would time them with time clocks or stopwatches. And then he would revise how that task or how that job should be done to increase efficiencies and reduce time. Um, so sometimes that meant, you know, different steps in executing the task. Sometimes it meant looking at the tools that the workers used. Um, and at that time, all the workers would bring their own tools, right? And, and so that created inefficiencies because, you know, 
person A might have a much better tool than person B. And so we can't be consistent and standardized across the tools. So one of the things that came from this was that as an organization, we supply the tools so we can have consistency across that. So there is, there is a video that goes along with this um, that I will share in the classroom when we meet in the classroom. Frank and Lillian, similar ideas as um, Frederick Taylor under the umbrella of scientific management, looking at time and motion studies. And so here we're also taking a look at all the individual movements that the worker is doing as they are, you know, engaging in their job. And so, you know, taking pictures, observing, to look at what motions can be reduced or taken out of that process. So similar ideas, you know, maybe slightly different techniques. Um, I hear that the study, no, not the study, but the movie Cheaper by the Dozen was inspired. I haven't watched it myself, but if you have, uh, you might recognize some of this thinking. Uh, so that it spilled over into the work home, into the, the work spilled over into the home domain, right? How can we be more efficient at home? Do you button, you know, your shirt top down or do you button it, you know, bottom up? And I think they come, Frank came to the conclusion that you do it bottom up because then you already have your hands up here and now you can put your tie on. So that is more efficient than having to move your hands, you know, a couple of times. In organizations today, uh, standardization might show up, for instance, in a process in HR. So when we are dealing with candidates applying for jobs, you know, we it's so quick and easy for a job candidate to shoot off their resume right now. And now the burden is on the HR unit to sort through all those, you know, thousands of resumes. Um, and the resumes look different, like the tools with uh, Frederick Taylor. Right, every resume is formatted differently because the job candidate has the power to design the resume. So what companies can do instead is that we can mandate an application form that's standardized. So job applications takes all the job candidates information and puts it into a template that is the same <laughs> across each job candidate, which now makes it more efficient for the company. Okay. So we will end on this slide. So clearly, you know, a lot of great thinking came out of this era of management. It was the first sort of um, venture into what management principles we can apply consistently in organizations. The focus was, as I've said, heavily on being efficient and productive. There's been backlash, of course, saying that this was an inhumane treatment of workers, companies, you know, factories, they increased productivity tremendously, they became more profitable, the workers themselves did not see much of that profit come through. Um, so, so the thought was, well, you know, managers are innovative, they are designing, and so they should reap the benefits, you know, shareholders and management. So today though, right? So the question is what from those principles can we use today? What still makes sense today as we manage and as we are employed by organizations? We are today more in a service economy. We don't do have productions and factory work like we did a hundred years ago. We have the point of sales between a person and the, the customer, the consumer. And so today it's more about making sure that our employees are content and happy because they are actually delivering what we are selling in the moment of purchase. So a lot more power, um, decision-making and authority lies with frontline staff today. And also we have knowledge workers, right? We use people's brains uh, and that is what actually accrues value for an organization. Uh, and when they leave, they take that with them. So we are in a different challenge right now, trying to retain that knowledge, manage that knowledge in the organization. Um, so that's what we're gonna look at in the next few uh, chapter two videos. So that's it for right now. Thank you and see you next time.